We are. Hi, everybody. Hi. Julie is in our store right now getting ready to herd a bunch of rabid Ellen Hildebrand fans for a signing. So uh, I get to host tea time today. So hello, everybody. That's Thanks exciting that she's there doing that. Yeah, she she did a similar thing outside the store um, a few months into the pandemic, I think. I'm trying to remember exactly when. And it was really fun, successful. Um, so I guess she figured she'd just keep on doing the same, same format for now and had a ton of people sign up. So I hope it's a lot of fun. Um, her new book is a collection of stories. It's set in oh. her Nantucket universe. Um, it sounds like a lot of fun. So. I can guarantee it won't be as much fun as this tea time. <laughs> uh, right? I, I, especially, especially if you get a Mike Nichols reference on there. Oh, yeah. We'll get it. <laughs> Not to worry. Oh, man. Here comes Amanda. Great. This is amazing. Okay. So. Let, we better get started. So uh, it'll go Steve, Andrea, Gabe, Tom, and Amanda. So Steve, please take it away. Okay. Well, it's October, everybody. And we I, I think we can say we're into the fall season and into the fall book season because there's so many incredible books coming out uh, between now and the end of the year. And um, uh, I'll just start with one of my favorites. Um, it's called The Whalebone Theater. It comes out tomorrow, I believe. And uh, it's a great big English novel. The author's name is uh, Joanna Quinn. And the book, it's, you know, it's a uh, it's set on an estate, you know, in the, I think it begins around 1919 and it's uh, in Dorset. So it's by the sea. You've got this, that whole atmosphere in the big house and all of that. And the star of the book is, um, her name is Christabel. And she's, I think, nine or 10 when the book starts. And she has her two uh, half siblings in tow. And they go down to the beach one day and they discover there's a beached whale that has landed on, on, the, on the rocks there. Uh, it's deceased when they find it. And Christopher <laughs> climbs up under the whale and claims it. And um, eventually it becomes the bones of that whale as, as Christabel gets a little bit older becomes the proscenium arch of a theater and it's called the Whalebone Theater. And these kids just love to put on plays and uh, especially Shakespearean plays. And it um, becomes a place where people want to go, you know, the place to be like uh, for the upper class of England and they travel to see plays at the Whalebone Theater. So that's a whole, there, there's a lot going on in this book and um, it, it, it evolves into the Second World War and where Christabel and her brother both become spies. So that's a whole nother section that's really interesting and, and lots of great plot twists. And meanwhile, the youngest sister is sort of managing the, the war at home on the estate. Um, this is kind of a, a little bit of a cross. I think the author hates hearing the Downton Abbey mentioned, but I'll mention it anyway. It's a little bit of a cross between Downton Abbey and uh, the book Great Circle that we published of a, a by Maggie Shipstead a few years ago that, that has a great uh, female character, very heroic as a lead. So uh, that's The Whalebone Theater by Joanna Quinn. It comes out tomorrow. Sounds, sounds good. great. Yeah, that sounds great. Yeah. Um, we have a bunch of people making comments already. Sarita loved Upgrade. Is that one of your escape? Blake Crouch? Right? Is that the one? No. Ah, oh, you're muted. Oh, dear. Or am I not? Uh-oh. Uh-oh, something's askew. 
Hmm. Anyone else Technical. want to talk? Okay, you're okay. Oh well. Well, Gabe can maybe. Well, I was going to ask Steve: Is do you know if any of that any is based on a real incident with the whale, or is it all? Oh tough yeah. To imagine. Oh, you're, you're on mute as well. <laughs> Everyone's so polite. Such good Zoom you etiquette. You could. Yeah, he's still on mute. Maybe I can unmute him. Oh, oh well. something is squirrely. <laughs> Mercury retrograde is over, everybody. We can't be doing this. <laughs> um, OK, I couldn't. Uh, there you are. I had that thing on my screen or whatever it was. Did you guys have that? I had some weird thing. Anyway, I couldn't unmute myself. And as far as I know, it's not. It's all, it's not based on a, a historical uh, person. Okay. Um, go ahead, Andrea. Pure fiction. Gotta love it. Sounds so good. Yeah, Margaret, I know what you mean there. Shadow phase, Mercury, shadow grade. Um, Beth Johnson said, forget about PSL, fall to me is new books. And I was like, PSL, the party for socialism and liberation. Oh, wait, pumpkin spice lattes. Um, yes. <laughs> and then um, <laughs> Kim says, thanks to your Rex, I read Act of Oblivion and Babel. I love them both. Thank you. So, yay, I'm glad everybody's reading. Um, yeah. Gabe, do you want to try leaving and coming back? Because I think we still can't hear you. No. And, and we just can't do that. <laughs> it's not as fun. Um, Andrea, you can go ahead. Um, I'm trying to, did you disable participant sharing? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, I'm trying to share the screen. Okay, got it. Okay. Um, so I want to talk about Feels Like Home, a song for the Sonoran Borderlands from Linda Ronstadt. Um, how exciting. This is out tomorrow. And it's, uh, I think, going to be one of the big fall um, gift books, for sure, going into the holidays. So um, as you know, Linda Ronstadt is a rock and roll uh, Hall of Famer, and she takes it on a journey to the place uh, that she calls home, which is the Sonoran Desert in Arizona. Um, and it's a very candid memoir, but it also has um, a cookbook element. It's got 20 um, really cool uh, recipes that she grew up with. Um, and I'm telling you, this is beautiful. There's a lot of great photographs in it. And um, I, I just think that this is for any fan and anybody that's into things like Sonoran cheese soup, um, which sounds really good, right? Um, I, I'm just like, I just think this is going to um, like appeal to a lot of people. And um, for the Linda Ronstadt lover in your life, what an excellent gift. You know, um, the, the thing about her that amazes me is that um, her... Um, she had a, I love that photo of her on the horse, by the way. Um, she had a record in, um, I don't know, like, let's see. I can't remember what, it, when it was like 19, 1987, it was a Spanish language record. Mm -hmm. And, um, it's like, uh, Cancion, uh, Cancionos, oh God, I can't even say, I can't even say what it is now. Um. Canciones de mi padre. So songs from my father. This is incredible. It is still the number one non-English um, language record ever sold in the United States. They it sold over 2.5 million copies. So that's saying something um, to her popularity um, among English and Spanish speakers. And I just, you know, come on. It's just a gorgeous cover. Um, it has everything going for it, you know, with, along with the, um, the cookbook element to it, the, you know, with all of the great, um, regional cooking that she grew up with, 
and who what's not to like i mean linda is such a cool person and um so get it while it's hot there's a big stack of this um that will be put on sale tomorrow at warwick's and um as you know the supply chain issues are still occurring so get it now because um i think this is going to go out of stock and it won't be it'll be hard to get um closer to the holidays so that feels like home linda ronstadt sorry i took so long to talk 35 dollars hardcover and that's from heyday press um a great little uh um small publisher out of san francisco thanks uh, for your patience love, we all love heyday margaret asks is it about the sonoran desert Yes, it is about the Sonoran Desert um, um, where she grew up. So it's it's a love letter to um, her childhood home, basically. So um, she lived around the Tucson area back in the day. And uh, Beth said, but did Linda meet Michael Mike Nichols? Brought to you. I am confident back in the day they met. They, they have their paths crossed, you know. Don't yeah. you think, Andrea? I have a feeling that probably um, <laughs> and her former uh, boyfriend, Jerry Brown, our former governor of the That's state, right. twice um, gave a nice blurb for it, too, which is nice to know that, um, you know, she stays friends with her exes. Not always the case, as we know, especially, <laughs> you know, in the insane world of celebrity so um it's really nice when i saw that quote i mean it really is um a nice quote you know um she, he calls it a quintessential american story touching and well worth reading along with some other uh beautiful words but when i saw that i thought you know what class act is la linda so um you know go out and get that book i just i think it's it's so sweet. Um, and, you know, there is the Mike Nichols, you know, <laughs> connection. We can't promise that there's a whole chapter about when they met in the Sonoran yeah. Desert. I don't think we can promise that, but, you know, we can just, just know it's in the background. Yeah. Well, I was hoping Gabe would be back by now, and apparently he's trying to get in, but Zoom's not showing me, Gabe, so... I somehow have exiled him by accident. Um, That's so weird. So I guess we move on to Tom for now. Okay. I think he'll get in, but when? Yeah. Um, okay, should I just go? Yes, please. Okay. So building off of what Steve said, like fall is here. And this tomorrow for me, I would say my two really like probably the two biggest books, the fiction and nonfiction that I have for the year are on sale tomorrow. The first is Celeste Ng's Our Missing Hearts. This is number one indie next pick. Um, so it's, um, of course, the, her third novel following um, uh, Little Fires Everywhere and Everything I Never Told You, the first novel. And this is, it, it shares a lot of qualities with the first two books, um, but, it's a, but it's also a departure. So what it shares is that Celeste has always been great about writing about family, and uh, especially ch children, teenagers, and how they connect to their parents or, or don't. Um, so the main character in this book is Bird, a 12-year-old who's living with his father. What's different, though, is that we're, it's set in a dystopia. So this is a near future that, unfortunately, scarily, rem will remind you of our present day. Um, it's a, our world taken a little bit further extremes, and it's an author authoritarian state. Um, America is living under what they call PACT, P-A-C-T, which is the Preserving American Culture and Traditions Act. That sounds familiar to <laughs> some of the things that are going on. Um, and her, uh, his mother has disappeared. She's become almost a, uh, she didn't intend to set off and be a rebel against the government, but that's who she's become because she's a poet. And her famous poem, a collection of poems is called Our Missing Heart. So it's about in many ways, the power of poetry, the power of words. Her father, his father is a linguist. So language is everywhere in this book. Um, and it's really, so that's the setting. And then it's an adventure story as Bird sets off to find his mother, Margaret, 
the, the Chinese American poet. Um, it's powerful, beautifully written, um, you know, deeply felt. Um, I mean, Celeste is one of the very best of uh, like authors on social media. She's always she's very connected to the social our, our world, the what's happening in the world right now, and that comes through in the book. So. Um, it was selected, it was announced over the weekend that it's the Reese Witherspoon pick for the next month. As I said, it's an Indie Next number one pick. Um, it's the first Reese pick that's um, a second time for an author, I think. She's the second time she's chosen a, um, Celeste. Um, so this will be one of the big books for the fall for sure. Um, the reviews are just starting to run. There was a front page rave from Stephen King on the front page of the New York Times book review. Um, I love this. Um, this re review from the Boston Globe, which says, heart-wrenching and brilliant. This is the book I will pass down to my children when they ask me what it was like to live through this time in history, the pandemic, anti-Asian attacks, and the racial justice protests that have come to define our moment. It captures the difficulty of bearing witness at personal cost to oneself and caring about things, even when they seem beyond fixing. So our missing heart, Celeste Ang, on sale tomorrow. Great. I think you're now muted. Maybe. There, there yeah, there's there's Gabe. Then Gabe's here. I don't know if we can hear Gabe, but well, can you yeah, hear me? I don't know what went on, but I saw that I saw you in the waiting room, so okay. I admitted you. I don't know why. Yeah, Andrew, you became calls. the host at some point. So Amanda, you called <laughs> yeah, it. Somehow. Yeah. See, I had a feeling. I was like, when I went to go send you the chat. Interesting. Sorry, Sorry about that, Gabe. Um, gosh, the Celeste Ng sounds amazing. It and, really is. Uh, if you're in San Diego. Oh, that's like, right. Yeah, if you feel like coming out, um, if you pre-order uh, the book through our event page, which I'm going to put in the chat right now, um, you can join an evening event with her uh, at University of San Diego on the 21st, which is a Friday. Um, yeah. It should be amazing in person, I'm sure. Yeah, should be fantastic. Um, just a heads up on that one. Uh, Celeste is asking that everyone who attends is masked. That's right. Um, yeah, if that's that impacts your decision out there. Otherwise, please, you know, if you can't make the event, please also do um, order. I'll put the regular book link in the comments here too. And there'll be, some, I think there are already some pre signed books at Warwick's. Oh, great. So good to know. Yeah. Okay, Gabe, I'm so sorry for all that. You want to go now? Something weird. I was on my iPad on devices, various devices, because I'm so committed. I, I gave Andrea all the power and I didn't realize it. So, yeah, I'm Crazy. still the host, by the way. I don't know if you can take that back, but it makes me nervous. <laughs> now I have to, I have to give the power to Gabe. Heavy is the head, man. <laughs> uh huh. All right, I will go. Yeah. So my first, uh, can you let me- Andrea, um, I'm gonna, I'm going to take away, wait, I think you have to give back. Andrew, um, Andrea, can you let me on? Can, can you hit my uh, three little dots on the upper right corner of my window, Andrea, and make me a host again? <laughs> I am most, oh, Okay, let me try. <laughs> Here's co-host Gabe. Well, which is the host now? Co-host, try that. Come on, girl. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Team effort. Um, first book I'm going to uh, discuss today: American Midnight by uh, Adam Hochschild. And many of you will remember his last really, really big book. He's written a number of really strong histories, uh, but a book on King Leopold and. Uh, what a monster he was with the Congo and the whole thing. So uh, big, big book, uh, sold really, really well. He's a really terrific writer. Uh, he's a, uh, you know, he's a historian's historian. And uh, this is, you know, it is a post-World War II America and the parallels uh, to today are, you know, like in fiction, I talk about fiction all the time, and I'm heavily nonfiction today. But in fiction, I always say there's uh, uh, 
all these uh, similarities that go on and uh, how everything re fiction reflects. It's a, it's a historical novel, yet it reflects the issues and the mores or the it, problems that are occurring in, in today's world. Um, so this is a book set post-World War II. Um, was a really dark time, like it is right now in America. It was a time of the McCarthy hearings. It was the response to communism, uh, which was a benevolent idea initially. The people that supported communism, of course, were humanists and humanitarians. Um, but because of the war and the situation with Russia, you know, they became vilified. And what, you know, it was a sort of a fascism like we have right now, you know, the right wing just sort of went full fascist, like, they, like they're going right now. And we had the McCarthy hearings, you couldn't say things you couldn't talk about, um, uh, I, I mean, topics that you just couldn't discuss. I mean, you couldn't have homosexuality in the movie. Uh, bombs were, mobs were burning black churches. Remember that. Uh, that was, you know, not, not far off of Jim Crow. Uh, race, immigration, labor rights, all that was fermenting in this period. And a good chunk of America decided to go uh, into the darkness as they've done today. I mean, I've seen people che cheering DeSantis for spending $12 million on a political stunt in Florida. You know, uh, you're seeing some really, really heinous stuff going on, uh, censorship, uh, sadistic policies in some of these states, uh, you know, just meant to punish anybody who's a little different or you disagree with. Um, so you had these anti-war uh, and who soon became uh, 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 pro labor, uh, pro union advocates, uh, champions of labor, champions of civil rights, etc. So from that darkness, we came to this light, but it really shines a light. I was actually just watching a movie yesterday, uh, set in, uh, and the backdrop was it was a spy novel about Americans bringing Nazis into America, um, with Kelly McGillis of all people from '88. Anyways, um, it. For some reason, you know, not we're not the only nation. I mean, you're seeing it in Poland, you're seeing it in Hungary, uh, whose response to any kind of illumination is pushing us into darkness and pushing us back into the, uh, you know, decades and decades past uh, through legislation and stuff. But um, I think, you know, he brings us, he really brings us pretty terrifying. It's pretty horrifying. Uh, you know, you, you couldn't speak up in court. Uh, if you were accused of being a communist uh, or if you spoke openly about something, you were charged and you had no options. You were pretty much muzzled by the court system and you were dragged out, you know, and you were either lost a job or you were jailed uh, or you were hung or any one of those things. So um, I just fought a lot of parallels to what's happening in America today. The right again is talking about violence. Uh, Donald Trump's fermenting violence, you know, Marjorie Taylor Greene's fermenting violence. Uh, it is really a scary, scary time. And this book, to those that are aware, will get it. You know, I think uh, on some people it will be lost, but it, uh, you know, you got a great, great historian, great topic. Not that, I mean, doesn't feel like it's that long ago, but it was like 70 years ago. Um, uh, but, you know, in, in history, not a long time. Anyways, I'm going on too long about this book, but I think it's important. And that's why. Yeah. And a good read. He's a really great writer. I, I, I have You'll a question. enjoy the misery. Is it? I mean, it looks great. And there's it was all, so much we've forgotten. We Maybe we knew and then forget. Um, is it at all um, reassuring to know that we've been through a similar period before and that we came out of it or i mean i'm looking for like that's how i would like to think but yeah no okay. i think a little I, bit know, I think that yeah i think you know the people that he mentions like emma goldman eugene debs um you know help push agendas and help bring the country and write the country uh, but you know we had a different supreme court back then I mean, yeah. the Supreme Court's getting together today to get every liberty for anybody who's not a white Christian or whatever that's happening today. But um, I'll discuss more of that on my next book. So much <laughs> more. more things change, the more things stay the same. Um, okay, Amanda, my tech support. Yeah, okay. I think I'm having some <laughs> internet connectivities as well. I can't share the screen. Um, so hopefully I don't uh, kind of 
come in and out, hopefully. Okay. But it seems to be one of those days anyway, so. Look at that background. All right. So first up, da -da -da, um, uh, Elin Hildebrand's Endless Summer. This is actually a collection of short stories um, from her. Um, so something a little different. Uh, many of these stories have not actually been published anywhere before. So, you know, brand new collection, um, a lot of really great stories in here. Um, and I mean, we're at the end of summer, endless summer, you know, we're just going to get a little bit more of those little last bits of summer vibes. I mean, granted here, our weather is summer until for a little bit longer. Um, but for the rest of the country, who's already into fall, as my decorations show, um, they can soak up a little bit of the last bits of summer. And of course, Elin does what she does best, really wonderful beach reads, um, you know, always set on the water, um, which is always beautiful to imagine uh, as you're reading. Um, so there you go, Elin Hildebrand's Endless Summer, a collection of short stories. Excellent. Yeah, and uh, she is probably imminently in Warwick's right now. Um, it's probably a little too late if you're not already headed down there to, to get down there, but we will have, I'm, I'm sure we'll have some, well, hopefully we'll have some signed copies left if you want to order through the link in the chat. Okay, Steve is up. All right, uh, another book for us that comes out tomorrow is, is that clear? It's uh, Wasu's uh, Stay True. Um, this is just a, a beautiful memoir. Um, it's kind of a combination coming of age memoir and, and grief memoir. Um, he went to, um, he's a, first of all, he's a, a staff writer at the New Yorker. Um, he went to school in Berkeley and there he met a fellow named Ken. They were both of Asian, both Asian Americans, and they became friends. And they had a group of friends that they hung out with. And they, in the book, you know, it's a lot about the music of the 90s and clothes and things. And it's a, a lot of that stuff. And then in the middle of all this, unexplaining, unexplainedly, Ken is killed, um, like in a, a, a random, he was picked out and he was carjacked and and murdered and he um so it, it's about how wasu dealt with that process processed it how and it's also a group of friends who are dealing with this together young people you know they're you know they're they're just in their first years of college and when this happens um, Ken was from San Diego, so part of the book takes place in San Diego, um, but it's just, a, and the writing is just gorgeous. It's just beautiful writing, and um, anyway, a few of us got a chance to meet him at a dinner. Tom was there, and from the store, um, uh, Julie, no, yeah, Julie and Mallory and Adrian all, all got a chance to meet him. He's just charming and just a wonderful person. Um, so this is a, a powerful, it's a slim no, uh, memoir, but it's it's just terrific. And it's uh, Stay True by Wa Su. I listened to it after the event. So I listened to it just recently, really. And it is great. It's a great listen also. I mean, yeah. he, read, he, he reads it, which is important. Um, yeah. But then so compressed, but so much power in every word. He's a gorgeous writer. Exactly. Exactly. Um, yeah. I. This is a very important book for the fall, I think. Thank you. Yes. Getting a lot of attention. I saw something in GQ the other day that was, uh, I forget the quote, they, they, what they said about him, but, or what he said, something about West Coast Asians are built different. It was a good article, very candid article on him. And he was also on CBS Sunday Morning yesterday doing a commentary, and it really pulled out the uh, coming of age part with his father, which is great. There's a great, right? He has a kind great of funny relationship. relationship with his father. He has father. a great relationship with his father, and they talk about music and different things. Right. Like but they that. do it a lot by because his father is in uh, where? In, is he in Japan or Taiwan? Yes. Or? I'm not sure, but, but they do a lot. They do a lot of communicating via fax, which is that's right, adorable that's right. and 
yeah. hard to imagine <laughs> these days. Yeah. I'm going to put the link for the Libro FM audiobook in here. Oh, great. Too. Thank you. Okay. And you're multitasking today. Wow. Oh, yeah. That's why I look like a chihuahua on crack. Always like, what was that? What was that? Um, okay. So who's up? Um, I am. So um, I wanted to talk for my second book um, about the evolution of Charles Darwin, the epic voyage of the beagle that forever changed our view of life on earth. This is by Diana Preston, um, who is a Los Angeles Times book prize um, winning historian of some note. And it's basically a just a dramatic, um, um, well, a look at the dramatic journey on the Beagle, as well as um, the time that um, Darwin spent on land too, that um, really hasn't been told in such a colorful um, and compelling way, I don't think. Um, so um, it basically chronicles um, Darwin's development um, from kind of a, a um, very green young scientist um, when he's making the trip out um, on the Beagle and um, how he really comes into his own, um, especially as um, he's taking, um, he actually spent more time on land, obviously, than um, in the, well, maybe not obvious to some people, but he spent a lot more time on land once uh, he arrived in the new world. Um, and so, and he was, um, as I said, very green and he had no real, like, um, he wasn't an explorer, right? He was a scientist and, um, you know, he wasn't really that butch is what I'm saying. And so like, he's like being like led on these, um, like amazingly <laughs> like, um, heroine journeys. Right. So, um, he had to, he had to, um, um, they had local guides that would help them like, and they were going, um, in across really rough, um, mountains, deserts. I mean, so this is all, uh, chronicled here very well. Uh, she's a great writer, Preston and, um, like down rivers, um, you know, checking out all the wildlife along the way, of course. And then um, the sea voyage, he, then she of course like get, goes into like how dangerous the sea voyage was. There was um, some tension among the crew. I mean, like it, this really, I would love to um, have a, see a movie um, like with, with all this like nonfiction um, narrative is based on because it would be pretty swashbuckling and cool, I think. Um, um, like there was tempest, there was an earthquake off the coast of Chile. They had to rescue a um, previous expedition. I mean, all this stuff that you don't really learn about when you're when we're talking about, um, you know, his great books, The Origin of Species and the Descent of Man. So, um, so we get all of that here. There's um, uh, unfortunately, I don't have um, any of the. There's none of the sixty or sixty. 6065 uh, maps and um, documents and um, uh, illustrations, but so it's going to be um, lavishly illustrated for this kind of um, historical narrative. Um, so you're just going to have to go and get this book um, by Grove Press, um, Diana Preston, um, $30, and that is out tomorrow. Oh, um, one very cool thing too um, the author, Diana Preston, um, is a distant cousin of um, of uh, Emma, the wife of Charles Darwin. Darwin. So that's um, and that's really what um, was the initial interest. She was like, hey, I wonder, like, you know, what kind of life like my cousin had, and like, you know, who was who? What's the and the the myth of who she was married to, and that's how this all started. Um, and I'm glad that she went down that rabbit hole because it's a very interesting and multi-layered history. How cool. I yeah. read her yeah. previous, I don't know if it was her previous book, but a previous book, The uh, Pirate of Exquisite Mind. 
uh, about Dampier, the uh, pirate uh, slash naturalist. Uh, and I read anything swashbuckling, but this is like Alexander von Humboldt and uh, Blackbeard. It was fun. Lively writer. Yeah. 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 She's good. So this is going to appeal to um, a lot of people on your um, holiday list for sure. It's got a lot going for it. I love it when, you know, these canon characters in our history are, are you know, not brought down, but humanized. And there, there was a book some years ago called Soon, an overdue history of procrastination. And Darwin was in it. Apparently it took him like, or he put off writing The Origin of Species for like two decades. <laughs> and so it, it was it, it, it kind of like a self-help book in that it, it, it profiled these people and Da Vinci, like people who procrastinated and still made it. It's created um, some of the most lasting. Absolutely. Well, that gives me hope. I've got to check that book out. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so, Tom. Okay. Yes. So it takes a lot for me to talk about present a book like the one I'm going to present. I apologize in advance. I won't do this very often. Maggie Haberman's Confidence Man on sale tomorrow. Subtitle, The Making of Donald Trump and the Breaking of America. So uh, you, I assume most of us have heard of Maggie Haberman by now. She is, uh, she is beloved by some, reviled by others. Uh, yeah. So over the last week, um, <laughs> I, I assume that was the case, Kate. Um, that was for you, the revile. Um, over the last week, like I, I have this sheet of, like the, over the last week, what do you call the leaks, I guess, or, you know, from the book have appeared in every single, you know, Rolling Stone, Washington Post, Daily Beast, <laughs> CNN. You could pick out the tidbit that, you know, Trump weighed bombing drug labs in Mexico after he mistook advisor, new book shows. Um, Trump told Chris Christie that he would condemn white supremacists, but not right away because, quote, a lot of these people vote, book says. So it's filled with all of that. Like, just when you think you won't be surprised or shocked or horrified by this man, it's there. But what I'm here to also say is that Maggie Haberman, um, she didn't, she interviewed him like she, she, she interviewed him three times, I think, for the book. That's the thing about Trump. He, he's, he's in all these people are traipsing through Mar-a-Lago. He's giving interviews to all of them. And then he, then of course he sends out messages saying, who are these people? I barely know them. I don't speak to them. Um, but what's different about Haberman is that, well, first of all, she she comes from, like her dad was a famous journalist for the New York Times. She comes from a journalism family. She worked at the New York Post in the 80s and 90s off and on, and now with the New York Times. But the Post period is when she saw Trump in New York. And so this is the full, like that's why Confidence Man is perfect title, perfect cover, because that's a young Trump. Because she's covering like <laughs> what we experienced over the last however many years, it all comes from his time in New York, and she is basically an expert on that period. So it's not, it isn't just the the salacious tidbits that have been leaked. It's a much bigger, you know, and and the reviews are starting to come, and the reviews have been really good. And the New York Times, Joe Klein said, this will be a primary source about the mo most vexing president in American history for years to come. I mean, that's kind of what the reviews say. It's like, do we want another book about Trump right now? No, but if we have to have one, this is the book that people should pay attention to. And so it's on sale tomorrow. I suspect this will be one of the biggest books of, on my list for a while. And that's Confidence Man by Maggie Haberman. React, please. <laughs> you know, well, she's... She was at the Post when the Post was at its peak, covering uh, everything that was New York, which was a lot of it was Donald Trump. So I, you know, I think she's like uh, really well suited because she was there. You know, she's been watching him for, I mean, closely for, for yeah, decades. That's right. That's what sets her apart from some of the other White House correspondents. And 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 I love her. I mean, it's weird, but Trump has a thing for her of sorts. 
he's he's quoted as saying, I love being with her. She's like my psychiatrist. So huh. <laughs> there you go. Wow. Yeah. So you won't be able to avoid her for the next period of time, I would say. <laughs> She's a great writer. Yeah, she is. I mean, but we could all just at another time we can debate ethics and things like that. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is that really journalism when you hold it for your book? That, that would be the subject if we were to get into that. Yeah, that would be what we were talking about. As a journalist. <laughs> but you know what? Was it uh, Woodward or Bernstein, whoever had the book just recently, same thing, right? I mean, exposed uh, Watergate yet. She Except is a lot of things she, for the book. She is the poster poster child for this subject though right now. Now she can okay. write. Yeah. Up. Oh. Amanda. I think. Yeah. There. Next up. Mm -hmm. All right. So I have a small batch bakes by Ed Kimber, who was on the uh, <laughs> the Great British Bake Off. Um, and so the reason that I selected this book, um, uh, not only obviously fabulous, I love me some baked goods, always need some baked goods in your life. Um, but I like the idea of the small batch bakes because most baking books you bake like a lot, you bake like a dozen cupcakes or two dozen cookies or eight croissants. I can't eat, I mean, well, I could eat eight croissants. I should not eat eight croissants in one sitting, um, or even like over a day or two. Um, so the idea of being able to have small batch bakes for one to two people for me is amazing because I just bake for me and I don't need to make all this food, you know, for the people that don't exist when I just want to bake for me. Um, so this is my personal favorite, small batch bakes, uh, because it's fun, it's delicious, but there you go. You can bake for one to two, three people um, with the recipes in this book um, and, you know, it makes it quick and easy um, home baking goods um, just for yourself. So there you go, Small Batch Bakes by Ed Kimber. Genius. Yeah. We had the Very confidence man. We had Small Batch Bakes. It's, how can you have any pudding if you don't eat your meat? <laughs> that looks really good. Get to dessert, that's what I say. There's really something good. to eating a croissant, though. I could eat a croissant. I could do it. They're mostly air. <laughs> it's all <laughs> air, I know. And a lot of butter. Yes. And butter. Oh. Butter suspended in air. Mm. Yes. Yep. <laughs> That's what I imagine heaven will be like. <laughs> then my wife says there are no croissants in heaven. It's like, why go? <laughs> why go then? <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have reached the lightning round. So yeah, I got one more book. Oh wait, I oh I totally forgot. I'm so sorry. The whole but, mess. Go for it. It's good times right now, man. They just roll with it, girl. Jocularity. So, from uh, Barack Obama's chief speechwriter, this book may get lost in the shuffle. And I feel like it needed a little bit of a, of a push. Um, I don't know why I took this book so personally. I'm, I think I know why I took this book so personally. So, I'm going to set it up. Um, uh, Cody Keenan, speechwriter for Barack Obama, he... Uh, made that amazing speech uh, in June of 2015 towards the end of his career after I've been like, when you're going to do something about social issues, Barack, let's get on it. And he really got on it. And um, so this is about a speech that he made uh, in these particular 10, there was, the, there was this 10 day window in June of 2015. And I remember it really well. Um, the Supreme Court voted on universal health care positively and they voted on on, uh, uh, on marriage rights. Um, so we passed marriage rights and that, and there was a third thing. Oh, I was in Seattle. Um, uh, but right around that same week, there had been that shooting in Charlotte, uh, South Carolina of the church, a white supremacist, right-wing extremist, uh, shot up a black church in Charleston um, and I remember the people from that church, like reaching out and forgiving this young person. Um, it was a really touching moment, uh, the way, the grace with which these people acted. And then this speech that was given by Barack right after the Supreme Court had passed uh, 
you know, a marriage equality and and uh, and healthcare, universal healthcare of sorts. And there was a lot of positivity in the air. I remember I was in Seattle that week, and Seattle's a lot of fun in June. They paint the side, the crosswalks are all painted rainbow colors because it's Pride Week. They have a huge pride parade, huge pride parade in Seattle. Um, and it was a beautiful 78 degree day in Seattle. And the world was so optimistic that, that you know, we were walking around town and the, the streets are all painted, everything's bright. It's a beautiful day. Everybody's happy. They had just legalized weed in Seattle. Everybody was in a really good, good place and a great sense of being. And I just remember just feeling. You know, you come over to America with the American dream and it's not what it's supposed to be. Uh, and I'm not complaining. I'm, I'm luckier than most people who were born here uh, from what I see. Um, and I've been pre very privileged and lucky. But that, that, that week, that window really epitomized the American ideal to me. Um, it, it, there was just, we were moving forward, you know, and you know, 18 months later, people are crying in the streets after the election. Um, and we didn't even know how bad it was going to be. You know, uh, I remember at work there after the election, they're like, if you need a couple of days to gather yourself, go ahead. I remember my doctor telling me the same thing about his daughter who worked for the Fox affiliate in L.A. And they were like, you guys need a couple of days to process. Take the time off. That's that's how affected uh, the Trump election was uh, was felt just coming off the heels of this great just moment in time so appreciate those moments in time um but i this is i think an important book uh in the conversation of where we're headed as as americans and and where uh where we could be heading and where we seem to be heading right now so uh i think it's an important book small uh doesn't seem like a big deal but i, I think it's Small, is it like kind of a gift size? No, no. I mean, a small window, small top. It feels like a small Oh, topic, oh. So it's. But, I, it's, but I, okay. it's, it really is, resonates with. Uh, so it's a powerful book. I find it to be a powerful book. Okay. Now it is the lightning round. Take it okay. away, Steve. I'll try to make it a true lightning round and go quickly. Um, also coming out tomorrow, The Ooh. Grandest Stage. Uh, by, uh, Tyler Kepner. This is a history of the World Series. Uh, what's I'm sorry. No, you froze okay, for just anyway. a moment. Yeah, you're good. Oh, okay. Uh, history of the World Series. There's never been a book that encapsulates the history of the World Series. This is the first one. 117 years, filled with great stories. Um, who rises to the occasion? Who doesn't? Managerial decisions. It's it, you know we're coming into the. Um, uh, playoffs and postseason, which for a baseball fan like me, and I know Tom is too, you know, it's just a great time of the year. Lots of great things happen. And Tyler Kepner is just a great uh, um, baseball writer. He just knows how to tell a story and get you involved and makes it interesting. He did uh, K, a history of baseball in 10 pitches a few years ago. Tom's got his cap on, I see. Um, and yeah, you've got stories like Albert Pujols this year, you know, just completely in his final year coming, coming back. So out tomorrow, a great gift for the holidays, the grandest stage in history of the World Series. Awesome. I am very, very surprised that no one's written a history of the I World Series. I was just gonna say that, that's wild. That's wild. I mean, yeah. there's so many baseball books, you know. Yeah. And and rightly so because it is the best game ever invented. Yeah. yeah. But um, <laughs> I I just that is shocking to me. That's very cool. I'm glad somebody finally did it. Well, you have people who cover like Roger Kahn, who is pretty much the Brooklyn Dodgers, or they have New York writers. But uh, yeah, that's someone who really just takes the entire history. It really is a surprise it hasn't been done. Huh. Yep. Your turn, Andrea. Okay. Um, I wanted to talk about two little books, London Style and Paris Style. 
Um, these are the little book of London and Paris style, and they're out tomorrow. These are um, small format. What are they? Um, seven by five, basically little hard covers um, that just look really good. Um, and it just uh, discusses um, both of the cities and their influence on fashion um, from, you know, like the uh, street looks of London in the 60s, uh, influencers, and then the whole, uh, you know, haute couture and um, chic of Paris as well. So these are just um, great little gift books, little stocking stuffers at $16.95 each um, for people who are interested in fashion on your um, list for the holidays. Those look great. Really cool, really cool little books, yeah. Little, little candy books, like, no, no, no. Oh yeah, I mean, you know, you put these at the, at a, you know, at the counter or faced out or something on an end cap and they just, you know, people, just, they just fly off because. Great pictures, great images. Oh yeah, they're, um, the people who do this Wellbeck Publishing know what they're doing. They're, um, they're from the UK and um, their, their illustrated books are great, so. Beth is pointing out that Ken Burns had a book um, uh, about the history of baseball, but was it all about the World Series, Beth? That was the history of baseball. Yeah, it was a, oh, okay. a, it was a tie-in, I think, to the series that that wonderful series. That oh, with did. that documentary, uh huh. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, let's go to Tom again. Yes. So um, my last book is Best of Friends by Kamala Shamsi. So she uh, her last book really is the book that broke her out. It was Home Fire which was a retelling of Antigone, but in the modern era, was on the list for the Booker. It won the Women's Prize. Uh, it was a really great book. So it's exciting to have a new book from her for the fall. Um, this is set both in Karachi, Pakistan and England. Um, it's really about, it's a book about female friendships. So these two teenagers in Karachi, um, they're coming of age in the 80s when just at the time when uh, Pakistan was moving from uh, General Zia to Benazir Bhutto. So a woman prime minister, there was a moment in time for Pakistan, I think, in many people's eyes when things were changing, things were, for women especially. Um, and so these two teenage girls are coming of age in that time period, but they could not be more different, like personality wise. They have a situation with a, a man, a boy, uh, that kind of changes everything about their relationship it seems, then you cut to 30 years later, they're 40 in their 40s, they're now in, in London, um, still very different, and yet they can't, they still are, they're bound together in so many different ways. So it's a beautiful story of like, uh, about, about friendship and po the power dynamics of friendship. Um, and it's almost like two novellas that, that are connected, obviously it's the same characters, but you're sort of coming of age in the first one, and now you have these mature women in the second half. Um, really a powerful, unforgettable kind of novel. I can't get, I still think about these, these characters. So that's Camilla Shamsi's Best of Friends. Beautiful cover too. You can tell yeah. immediately that it's yeah. a Riverhead book. Like, exactly, yeah. I don't know who's making those covers, but they're <laughs> genius. Yeah, I agree. Okay. Um, Gabe? Me. Amanda. Amanda. Okay. I uh, so I got, as per usual, my kids' titles, Sisterhood of Sleuth by Jennifer Chambliss Bertman. Um, this book I love is what I call my grandma approved book. Um, it's a great multi-generational read. Um, it's a young girl. Uh, she works at her mother's antique store. And one day she gets a crate of Nancy Drew books, original Nancy Drews. And in the bottom is a photo of three women. And one of the women she swears is her grandmother. She doesn't know who the other two women are though. But she takes the picture to her grandmother and her grandmother's like, that's not me. That's so, I don't know where this photo is. That's not me. But she's like, no, I know this is my grandmother. After a little bit of digging, she figured out one of the other women in the picture is the original, original Carolyn King, the first woman who wrote under that name and the first uh, few Nancy Drew books. Now she's on a mission to figure out 
who are these women? Who is the other one in this picture? And why is her grandmother saying if it's not her in this picture? She joins up with two other friends. And along the way, they meet, they work with a librarian. And they learn about, you know, Nancy Drew and the history of the all, all the authors, Carolyn King. And, um, you know, it's just a really great friendship story. Um, and it's just really fun. And it's just, and again, I think, you know, it's, so, it's such a great book because so many people love Nancy Drew of all ages. Um, and so it's got a little bit of a mystery of, you know, who are these women um, in this picture? How do the books wind up on her doorstep? Um, and so there you go, Sisterhood of Sleuths. I think Nancy Drew was the first series I ever got super into. Yeah, good stuff. Okay, Gabe. So I'm gonna finish up with somebody very spectacular. New Elizabeth McCracken book coming from mm. Harper on sale tomorrow. All my books on sale tomorrow that I'm discussing today. Um, so McCracken, uh, what can you say? Giant's House, backlist book, uh, sold forever, forever, forever. Been around for 25, 30 years or something. Uh, she uh, was just nominated for the uh, Pulitzer for her short story collection, uh, the Souvenir Museum, which is out in paperback now. Uh, and it is a great collection of stories. And this book here is about, uh, it's a novel about a, a woman um, who after her mother's death uh, has to come to terms with her mother's life uh, as well as her death. And her mother was a very private person. Um, they live in New England. The house is uh, been all winnowed out. So everything is cleaned out, ready to get to be sold. And she flies off to London, her mother's favorite city. And as she explores London, she harkens back to her life with her mother and uh, the, the complex, uh, difficult person that she was, very private. Um, and she decides to start writing about her and the conversation of, um, do I have the right to expose my mother's life uh, comes into it. But it's, it's, a, it's a writer of a cer certain age at a certain point in her life. And I think similar to what Bobby Ann Mason did last year or a couple of years ago with her last novel, um, she, she imagined herself somewhere else uh, looking back at a section of her college years and this, it's the author looking back at her uh, life with her mother um, and expressing it in a manner uh, that a, a writer can and how they process things. So this is very much, I think, a mental exercise for Elizabeth McCracken, a cathartic exercise for McCracken. Her mother's passed away recently and all that stuff that goes with it. Uh, uh, I found it really readable. It's not a very big novel. It's a really short novel. Uh, and they're all the rage right now, short novels. Wonderful. Uh, Beth is asking, is anyone repping the new Rebecca Mackay coming out in February? I have some questions. That would be me. Yeah. Spent uh -huh. time. Have you read it yet? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's it's so good. It's so different. But all of her, each of her books is different from all the others. So, but it's uh, spectacular. Yeah. Great. I'll be, I'm sure I'll be talking about it many times on Tea Time Tea Time. There's another great cover. Is that also Riverhead? Uh, Rebecca McCann. No, it's a uh, Viking. Okay. It's Viking, yeah. Great cover. It is a good cover, though. All right. Um, thank you, everybody, for hanging out and thank you reps for coming and everyone out there who's still watching. You know, we're an hour deep, um, <laughs> but so many incredible books and truly something for everybody. Um, so yeah, I'll just mention again, um, Celesting, her book comes out tomorrow, but if you wanna come join us on the 21st, check out the event page. Also, I can't remember if Tom mentioned it because I was discombobulated trying to get Gabe back in, um, but uh, Reese's book club pick. Oh Celestine, yeah. Celesting, yeah, the, yeah, that's her newest pick. Um, we also have, Again, if you're in San Diego, um, the San Diego Writers Festival is this weekend and there are gonna be all sorts of cool authors. It's at the Coronado Public Library. Um, so if you want another book celebration event, uh, come on down. And we did just also announce an, uh, an event with Barbara Kingsolver. It's a mm -hmm. 
free virtual event. She's talking about her new book, Demon Copperhead. So that should be really good oh, too. Good. Yeah, I'll put it in the in the email tomorrow if you want more details. I'll be talking thank about you, everybody. That. Yeah, this was fantastic. So many books. All right. Thanks, Bye. Facebook friends. Bye, everybody. Yeah. All right, Joe, I got the roll. Yes. Let me uh, stop streaming.